instructor for this course, and uh, I will try to produce for each module in the five modules for this course a short introduction, a, a mini lecture, if you would. Let's not use the word lecture. Let's use a, a, a term like a presentation where we talk about what this module is all about. This module is kind of fun because in addition to introducing our uh, new textbook, this book of readings, we're also going to take a step back and we're going to look at a classic film that introduces a very important, fundamental underpinning for what we're doing today in instructional technology and distance education. The film is titled Teaching Machines and Programmed Learning. You may be wondering why we would look at a 50-year-old film, 50-plus years. Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. First, it features three of the great names, the founding fathers, and they were all men, of the education and psychology movement of the 50s and 60s, B.F. Skinner, A.A. A. Lumsdane, and Robert Glasser. Now, these are the names that everybody knew 50 years ago, and we'll talk about uh, why they're important, and we'll take a look at what they have to say. Second, some of the great ideas, great men, great ideas, some of the great ideas that still are being applied and attempted to be understood today were introduced, or at least reintroduced, uh, in this film and by the movement that these three uh, scholars talk about. And finally, one of the great dilemmas that haunt us today, the role of the teacher in a, a, an age of technology, an age of machines, if you would. What is the role of the teacher? This was something that was of concern and explained in this film, and it's still an issue that we today are dealing with. But let's set the stage, if we could. This is the 50s, uh, a decade after World War II, a decade after, a decade after when science and technology had solved the problems of the world. They won this massive war. Uh, the technology had allowed industry to deliver massive amounts of uh, material that were needed for the war effort. There was a, a feeling in the United States that science and technology could solve any problem. And the people that had been involved in that massive war movement were now involved in other endeavors. But they took the same mindset, the same set of beliefs, feelings, thoughts, if you would, that science could solve problems. And one of the major areas where there were at least thought to be problems was the educational system. Sounds a little bit familiar. We think today is a period of time when education is going through a lot of scrutiny, a lot of evaluation, maybe a, uh, an evolutionary change, maybe revolutionary changes. In the 50s, the same thing was happening. Because we had these scientists who now said, we can understand the teaching and learning process. We have the tools to make a direct impact. So give us the opportunity. So we have psychology looking at how people learn. We had technologies, machines, if you would, that allowed us to do things they couldn't do before in the classroom. Well, that brings us to this film. Um, it's a classic. There's, a, there's an article that we could write about it, but it's also something that we want to study and we're going to look at. It's divided in our instructional materials into six parts. Uh, the first part, uh, B.F. Skinner, and if there is a name you haven't heard before, you should have. B.F. Skinner, considered to be the founding father the, of behaviorism, behaviorism, behave, behavioral movement, which is based upon the, the concept that we can't see what's happening in a person's mind when they're learning. So we have to look at the consequences of the learning process, the behaviors, the performance, the outcomes. Behaviorist movement, among many things it gave us, was is the concept of behavioral objectives. We call them learning outcomes today, but it's the same concept. What can you do as a consequence of the learning process? This was one of the first widely accepted theories of learning, which was at the foundation for cognitive theory and, and even uh, constructivism, uh, a theory often uh, ballyhooed today as, as how uh, instruction, as a basis for how instruction ought to be designed. Um, in addition to that, Skinner talked about the program learning movement, talked about, there's books like this one that came out, Trends in Program Learning. Uh, this one is by Olfish and Meyer Henry, but there were a number, and I think they'll show in one of the books that, uh, on best practices with program learning. But the program learning movement 
also the individualized instruction movement gave us a number of really critical ideas that are talked about in this first episode of this six-part episode of this 16 millimeter film, which is converted into video. Immediate knowledge of results, or knowledge of correct response, it was called. Um, Skinner talks about this as a very strong motivating force. It motivates the learner because they know how they're doing. They're getting immediate feedback and they want to progress and that really motivates them. But you can take a look at the, the film and the children that are working on the teaching machines and you make your own mind up about that. But this is a fundamental principle that is being applied and sometimes misapplied today. Um, we also talked about, or Skinner talks about and we talk about today, learning at your own pace. Isn't this one of the uh, characteristics that makes many people uh, very favorable and positive about in, about uh, distance education. You can learn when and where you want, maybe at your own pace, spend as much time as you want. Um, uh, the program learning and instruction movement that Skinner talks about also talked about um, learning in very small steps. You learn incrementally. You build the teaching process so that it takes us successfully through one small step to another small step to another small step. So ultimately we're successful in accomplishing whatever it is that our program instruction is designed to help us accomplish. Skinner talks about the 95% of any student group of students can be successful or 95% successful rate. Um, and you can cover twice as much material. And that's an idea that's going to come back to us. These are some things that Skinner talked about. As, as I said, the the, the programmed instruction movement was paralleled by the individualized instruction movement. And the individualized instruction movement of the 60s, 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s gave us a number of uh, basic rules, like the 90-90 rule, which is a really important one, which says, and is supported by a considerable amount of data, that 90% of any content or any subject can be learned by 90% of any population group of students given enough time. So time for the vast majority of people is the differentiating characteristics, not intellectual ability, let's say, or even teaching consequences. Second part of the film. Here's where Lumsdane comes to talk to us. And he shows a whole collection of machines, really nifty machines, and, and take a look at a, a, a number of them. He talks about Pressy, and here's another big name, probably. Uh, they couldn't get him to be a participant in the 16 millimeter film. And you see the, the young girl. Uh, at her machine. It's kind of uh, interesting to see the, the, the interplay and how they, they scripted and put together the 16 millimeter film. He says the heart of programmed instruction is the program, not the machine. Does that sound interesting today? We talk about technology. We talk about uh, uh, the content management system. And, but what really is important is, and, and, and Lumsdane talks about this. It's the content that's delivered by the machine, by the computer in today's age, but it's that what's important in produces learning. He talks, he mentions 300 frames uh, in six weeks, and you can learn high school physics. Hmm. Uh, take the word frames out and put the word web pages in, uh, or slides, or something else, and you can see the similarities that uh, uh, maybe relate back to what Lumsdane was talking about 50 years ago. He talks about a guy named Crowder, too, another big name, who instead of advocating small steps, he advocated large chunks, or larger steps, larger content bodies, and then students would respond to a series of questions before they would be allowed to move to the next step. And here's where we introduced, instead of linear programming, step by step by step, branched programming where you would answer a question and if you got the right answer you got to proceed if you got the wrong answer you were remediated you went through another remediation loop hmm, sounds interesting something that maybe machines had a difficult doing doing uh, looking at if you ever get a chance look at a, a branch program textbooks which jumps around from page to page um, then we go to part three um, and and here there is a discussion of short videos remind you of YouTube or maybe even this short video. And so we build upon this whole sequence that uh, uh, Lumsdane talks about with the teaching machines. Now we move to part four with Glasser. A uh, little wooden, isn't he? Uh, he kind of sits there and talks. And, and uh, But after a very short time, you forget about his woodenness. And you start to listen to some of the things he has to say. He talks about the changing role of the teacher. Here's where that kind of concept, if not uh, introduced previously, certainly wasn't implied. Um, 
educators and what their role would be. And, and he, he mentions that they're observers and they're improvers and they discuss and they encourage. He doesn't say the word present. He talks about these, these, this role of the teacher where they're not the content presenter, but they're the ones who facilitate the teaching and learning process. We're going to look at an article a little later that I wrote uh, later in this course that talks about the teacher as a skewermorph, and we'll talk about what that is, but it, it basically talks about what the role of the teacher should be in this age where content can be delivered by our technology tools. In our case, it's the Internet and the web and the programs that we design. Uh, student motivation is also mentioned by Glasser. He talks about um, knowledge of correct results, and this is a strong motivating force, something that we research and we encourage today when we talk about how individualized instruction delivered at a distance is designed. And here again, he talks about the shorter time to learn. And this reminds me a little bit, if you're not familiar with it, you should look it up, the, the recent United States Department of Education meta-analysis report, which says that online learners learn more than traditional learners. And then when you read the study, you find out that's because online learners spent more time in other words, if you uh, keep time amount as a constant and, and, and vary how much they learn, in other words, if you've got the ability to spend a little bit more time learning this, you're going to learn a little bit more. Well, teachers have known that for, for a long time. And the online learning environment, the distance education environment, gives us that flexibility. We're not in a classroom. Part five, Glasser then talks about future needs, um, curriculum production, and how the curriculum will be designed and who designs it. Reminds me a little bit of the massive open online courses, the MOOCs, and uh, de designing one physics class that everybody views with th tens of thousands of classmates in it. And, and if you look then at the history of things, you can see then why in the 60s the, the physics on film movement and in the 70s, the televised movement, like Sunrise Semester, were popular for a short period of time before there were some concerns identified about that delivery approach. Um, he talks about the changes in the school system. Sounds familiar. Uh, and he holds up that source book. It's a, here's the best practices. Well, you know, we've got best practices books today. Here's Dr. Oriana's book, one of our faculty, The Perfect Online Course. But basically what this is is a source book for how we use best practices when we're designing online courses. So the concept of trying to identify these scientifically demonstrated techniques and infuse them into our teaching and learning is a recurring theme. Uh, part six, we come back to B.F. Skinner. And he mentions a couple of things, such as other types of machines lie ahead. Well, this is before, really, computers. We had the large computers that were used during World War II, but there were no microcomputers. There were no computer terminals at this point. But Skinner talks about what kind of machines we're going to have in the future and what impact they're going to have. Um, and he also introduces the topic of economics in the teaching process. And I'm sure he's referring to if we can design a wonderful program and apply it in a lot of schools, that's an economy of scale so we don't have to teach the same course multiple times in millions and thousands, tens of thousands of different locations. I like the, the use of the generic uh, masculine, uh, man can make what man can make of man. Well, we know today that's not the way we talk. We talk about what we can do for each other in the teaching and learning process. By the way, at the end of this, and at the beginning, uh, for that matter, we talked about uh, there's a who sponsors this? The Department of Audiovisual Instruction of the National Education Association. This was before the National Education Association became a teacher union. One of its departments was the Department of Audiovisual Instruction, which which branched away from NEA about the time that they became uh, a teacher union, and that is at the basis. The DAVI is the uh, predecessor of the Association for Educational Communications and Technology, AECT, arguably mo the most important professional association for those of us in the field of instructional technology and maybe even distance education. Um, finally, the teaching machine and program learning movement introduce a number of really important issues that we're going to talk about and that we should uh, discuss in our forum. Machines can deliver content. We know that. Uh, 
Teachers' roles are changing. What does that mean? Um, there are best practices. How do we identify them? How do we pull them together? How do we implement them? There are some economic issues that are being introduced. And all you have to do is listen to what the legislators around are saying about online courses and the massive open online course uh, movement to know that some people are very worried about the economics behind the education system, teaching and learning system. And the, uh, the whole ideas that were introduced 50 years ago and probably were reintroduced by them, but now that we are using as a foundation for our understanding of advanced applications in instructional technology and distance education. Have fun with this one, and I hope you enjoy the video.